So we've talked through the pathophysiology of how poliovirus causes paralysis. But the thing is, poliovirus only causes paralysis in less than 1% of people who get it. Because at its core, poliovirus is an enteric virus. It's only by accident that it ends up infecting neurons. Now, what do we mean by accident? Well, we mean that infecting neurons doesn't help poliovirus survive. To survive, poliovirus wants to infect people and then get transmitted to more people. And that's all done through the gut and through fecal oral transmission. So the neuronal infection and the paralysis, that's all a side effect that doesn't help the virus. So you need to reprogram your idea of poliovirus. Polio can present in many ways, and almost all of them make sense if you understand the pathophysiology. Each clinical syndrome that it causes corresponds to the virus stopping at a certain step in the chain of steps that we talked about, from GI tract all the way down to the CNS. So first of all, it turns out that in 90% of people, the virus never gets into the blood in serious quantities. So they have no symptoms. They do have viral replication in the gut, and they shed the virus into their feces, and they can spread it to other people, but they never know it. So we call that subclinical. So in about 8% of people, the virus does get through the lymph nodes and into the blood, but then doesn't get into the central nervous system. So these people do have symptoms, and those symptoms are because of the viremia. Like what? Just general symptoms of systemic inflammation. Regular viral symptoms like fever, malaise, headache, maybe vomiting. And if the infection doesn't go any further and stops here, then we call it abortive polio. Now in 1% of people, the virus does go on from the blood into the CNS, but it doesn't get to the point of killing motor neurons or causing paralysis. So how do we know it's in the central nervous system then? Well, two ways. First of all, we can actually find it in the CSF. And second of all, there will be symptoms of meningitis because the virus is causing some inflammation. And so you'll have neck stiffness, photophobia, fever, and we call this non-paralytic poliomyelitis. Finally, in 1% or actually less than 1%, you get paralytic poliomyelitis. And so in these, the virus infects the motor neurons as we talked about. These patients become weak and eventually paralyzed. And what muscles are paralyzed? Well, it can actually be anywhere. It can be arms, legs, and that would make you disabled for life. But the diaphragm is actually also innervated by spinal motor neurons. And so if those motor neurons are affected, you can actually have trouble breathing and die. But we don't only have lower motor neurons in the spine. We actually also have them in the brainstem. And these are the lower motor neurons that make up cranial nerves. And it turns out poliovirus can actually infect these two. And when it does, we call it bulbar poliomyelitis, where bulbar means in the brainstem. Now this is rare and actually more serious since it can make people unable to swallow, breathe, and so on. And 50% of people with bulbar poliomyelitis die. And so what is the time frame for all this? Well, from the beginning of infection to when you first get the systemic symptoms is about a week. And then from systemic symptoms to neural symptoms is another week.